All right, hi, I'm Miss Olivia. I'm going to be reading the first chapter of A Throne of Glass by Sarah J. Mass. Uh, I started falling in love with this series a couple months ago because my friend showed it to me and I was like, whoa, this is really cool. It has kind of like a Harry Potter feel, but also Hunger Games, so it's a bit of a mix of both. Um, yeah, so. In a world without magic, an assassin is summoned to the castle. She comes not to kill the vicious king who rules from his throne of glass, but to win her freedom. If she defeats 23 killers, thieves, and warriors in a competition, she will be released from prison to serve as the king's champion. Her name is Selina Sardothian. The crown prince will provoke her, the captain of the guard will protect her, and a princess from a faraway land will befriend her. But something evil dwells in the castle, and it's there to kill. When her competitors start dying one by one, Selina's fight for freedom becomes a fight for survival, and a desperate quest to root out the evil before it destroys her world. After a year of slavery in the salt mines of Endervir, Selina Sardothian was accustomed to being escorted everywhere in shackles and at sword point. Most of the thousands of slaves in Endovia received similar treatment, though an extra half-dozen guards always walked Selina to and from the mines. That was expected by Ardalun's most notorious assassin. What she did not usually expect, however, was a hooded man in a black at her side, as there was now. He gripped her arm as he led her through the shining building in which most of Endovia's officials and overseers were housed. They strode down corridors, up flights of stairs, and round and around until she hadn't the slightest idea of where she was. At least, that's what her escort's intention was, because she hadn't failed to notice when they ended up, uh, at least that was her escort's intention, because she hadn't failed to notice when they went up and down the same staircase within a matter of minutes. Nor had she missed when they zigzagged between levels, even though the building was a standard grid of array, a standard grid of hallways and stairwells. As if she'd lose her bearings that easily, she might have been insulted if he wasn't trying so hard. They entered a particularly long hallway, silent save for their footsteps. Though the man grasping her arm was tall and fit, she could see nothing of the features concealed beneath his hood. Another tactic meant to confuse and intimidate her. The black clothes were probably a part of it too. His head shifted in her direction, and Selina flashed him a grin. He looked forward again, his iron grip tightening. It was flattering, she supposed, since she didn't know what was happening, or why he'd been waiting for her outside of the mine shaft. After a day of cleaving rock salt from the innards of the mountain, finding him standing there with six guards hadn't improved her mood. But her ears had pricked when he introduced himself to her overseer as Cole Westfall, captain of the Royal Guard, and suddenly the sky loomed. The mountains pushed from behind, and even the earth swelled towards her knees. She hadn't tasted fear in a while, hadn't let herself taste fear. When she awoke every morning, she repeated the same words, I will not be afraid. For a year, those words had meant the difference between breaking and bending. They had kept her from shattering the darkness of the mines. Not that she let the captain know any of that. Selina examined the gloved hand holding her arm. The dark letter the dark leather almost matched the dirt on her skin. She adjusted her torn and filthy tunic with her free hand and held in her sigh. Entering the mines before sunrise and departing after dusk, she rarely glimpsed the sun. She was frightfully, frightfully pale beneath the dirt. It was true that she had been attractive once, beautiful even, but, well, it didn't matter now, did it? They turned down another hallway and she studied the stranger's finely crafted sword. Its shimmering pommel was shaped like an eagle mid-flight. Noticing her style, noticing her stare, his gloved hand descended to rest upon its golden head. Another smile tugged at the corner of her lips. You're a long way from Rifthold, Captain, she said, clearing her throat. Did you come with the army I heard thumping around earlier? She peered into the darkness beneath his hood, but saw nothing. Still, she felt his eyes upon her face, judging, weighing testing. She stared right back. The captain of the Royal Guard would be an interesting opponent, maybe even worthy of some effort on her part. Finally, the man raised his sword hand, and the folds of his cloak fell to conceal the blade. 
As his cloak shifted, she spied the gold wyvern embroidered on his tunic, the royal seal. "'What do you care for the armies of Ardalan?' he replied. How lovely it was to hear a voice like her own, cool and articulate, even if he was a nasty brute. "'Nothing,' she shrugged. He let out a low growl of annoyance. Oh, it'd be nice to see his blood spill across the marble. She'd lost her temper once before, once, when her first overseer chose the wrong day to push her too hard. <laughs> she still remembered the feeling of embedding a pickaxe into his gut and the stickiness of blood on her hands and face. She could disarm two of these guards in a heartbeat. Would the captain fare better than her late overseer? Contemplating the potential outcomes, she grinned at him again. Don't you look at me like that, he warned, and his hand drifted back toward his sword. Selina hit her smirk this time. They passed a series of wooden doors that she'd seen a few minutes ago. If she wanted to escape, she simply had to turn left at the next hallway and take the stairs down three flights. The only thing at... Oh. The only thing all the intended disorientation had accomplished was familiarizing her with the building. Idiots. "'Where are we going again?' she said sweetly, brushing a strand of her matted hair from her face. When he didn't reply, she clenched her jaw. The halls echoed too loudly for her to attack him without alerting the whole building. She hadn't seen where he put his key. She hadn't seen where she, he put her key to her irons, and the six guards who trailed them would be nuisances, not to mention the shackles. They entered a hallway hung with iron chandeliers. Outside the window lined windows lining the wall, night had fallen, lanterns kindled so bright they offered few shadows to hide in. From the courtyard, she could hear the other slaves shuffling towards the wooden building where they slept. The moans of Agni amongst the clang of chains made a chorus as familiar as the dreary work songs they sang all day. The occasional solo of the whip added to the symphony of brutality Ardalan had created for its greatest criminals, poorest citizens, and latest conquests. While some of the prisoners were people accused of attempting to practice magic, not that they could, given that magic had vanished from the kingdom, these days more and more rebels arrived at Endovir. Most, from, most were from Eloe, one of the last countries still fighting Ardalan's rule. But when she pestered them for news, many just stared at her with empty eyes, already broken. She shuddered to consider what they endured in the lands. She shuddered to consider what they endured at the hands of Ardalan's forces. Some days, she wondered if they would have been better off dying on the butchering blocks instead. And if she might have been better off dying the night she'd been betrayed and captured, too. But she had other things to think about as they continued their walk. Was she finally to be hanged? Sickness coiled in her stomach. She was important enough to warn an execution from the captain of the royal guard himself. But why bring her inside this building first? At last, they stopped before a set of red and gold glass doors so thick that she couldn't see through them. Captain Westfall jerked his chin at the two guards standing on either side of the doors, and they stomped their spears in greeting. The captain's grip tightened until it hurt. He yanked Selina closer, but her feet seemed to be made of lead, and she pulled against him. "'You'd rather stay in the mines?' he asked, sounding faintly amused. "'Perhaps if I were told what this is all about, I wouldn't feel so inclined to resist.' "'You'll find out soon enough.' Her palms became sweaty. Yes, she was going to die. It had come at last." The doors groaned open to reveal a throne room. A glass chandelier shaped like a grapevine occupied most of a glass chandelier shaped like a grapevine occupied most of the ceiling, spitting seeds of diamond fire onto the windows along with far side of the room. Compared to the bleakness outside these windows, the opulence felt like a slap to the face, a reminder of how much they profited from her labor. In here, the captain of the guard growled and shoved her with his free hand, finally releasing her. Selina stumbled, her calloused feet slipping on the smooth floor as she straightened herself. She looked back to see another six guards appear. Fourteen guards plus the captain, the gold royal emblem embroidered on the breast of black uniforms. These were members of the royal family's personal guard, ruthless, lightning-swift soldiers trained from birth to protect and kill. She swallowed tightly. Light-headed and immensely heavy all at once, Selina faced the room. On an ornate redwood throne sat a handsome young man. Her heart stopped as everyone bowed. She was standing in front of the Crown Prince of Ardalan. All right, well, that was our first chapter Friday for this week. 
Uh, this is again Throne of Glass by Sarah J. Mass, published by Bloomsbury. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope you guys enjoy the series. Bye!